my wife tells me what I do in the bed, tossing, turning, and throwing fists until the point that I wake up and I see him standing on the side of my bed holding a knife, as real as any person near you. He's there. And that lasts for a couple of minutes until my brain apparently decides to shut that off. That's what I go through. We just listened to the voice of a survivor who had to fight for his life back in 1997 from two men who he was giving a ride when they tried to rob him and take his life. We are watching the commutation hearing of one of those men. At the end, I'll unpack it. With that, let's jump in. Seize 399-325. You're classified as a second felony offender. You were sentenced out of Jefferson Parish to a 50-year sentence in 1999 as a habitual offender for armed robbery. You currently now do have a parole eligibility date, which was August 1st, 2021. You have a good time date, April 8th, 2047. Full term date is August 6th, 2047. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wise. Mr. Wise, you're still muted. I was looking over your files here on your uh, uh, let me get it right here. on your master prison record. You have a parole eligibility date of 8-1-2021. That is your parole eligibility date. Today, that's what you're asking for. If you could go through the course and try to get your parole eligibility date, we well, you have a parole eligibility date on 8 2021. You've done some good program, done some good things while you've been incarcerated, and uh, I commend you on some of the things you've done. But you have a parole date today, and I'm just going to tell you right up front, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably deny and let you go before your parole eligibility date. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Renato, you're muted. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I'm sorry. Um, I don't see any other questions on the board. I had just one of you, Mr. Howard. You had a write-up, a DB, in 2019. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And and you were removed from the barracks. What was that write-up for? I had IBS, and I had to make an emergency to go to the hospital. Okay. I had it twice, and uh, the captain sent me here to take care of medical. I didn't know I got written up until I got here. Okay. All right. Um, Morgan Garan, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, Nothing other than he does work. He's assigned to the administration building, and obviously um, to work up there, he has to be uh, trusted, first of all, by the unit managers. And then secondly, we approve that he's been working up there. He's consistent and uh, everyone's pretty much comfortable with him. We're respected. Good, thank you. Um, As I said, I don't see any questions by my colleagues. So if uh, staff, if you could introduce the speakers, please. Okay, I think we're gonna hear from Ms. Leona Howard first, please. Good morning. Am I ready to speak? Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Thank thank you all for having me, allowing me to be here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm uh, Leona Howard. I'm Oliver Howard's wife. We met back in 2007. We got married in 2011, and we still married. And all I have seen was I have seen a little most of our relationship has been positive. And I know he's a um, very honest person. He's really been into God and teaching and he is a good minister. Um, Oliver have came a long way. 
far as what he told me, but I can only tell you what I see. And he seemed to be a really, res he is really respectful. And he's, he's very deeply sorry for what he done. Um, and I know if he could go back, he would, and he would do things over. He's not a person that want to hurt anyone. And he didn't mean to hurt Mr. Frey, but as he did, he's asking for forgiveness from Mr. Frey. He already asked, Mr., uh, he already asked God to forgive him, but he haven't had that chance to ask Mr. Frey to forgive him of what he's done. And I will talk as mostly when he get out getting a job, he already have a blueprint he done done up for our home, our new home. I've, I've been working um, as a caregiver for 16 years, a direct caregiver for people with disability. And we have spoke on us uh, get, um, with uh, getting a business, one of the business is with bringing people, to have people to come in that don't have somewhere to stay and doing street ministry and getting in the church. We have a church home that he found some years ago that I've been going to since this virus, I haven't been attending. But um, I know he a hard worker and everyone that I spoke with during Angola, during the barracks, he have been, uh, everyone love him because he know what kind of person he, they know what kind of person he is. They be around him. I can, like I said, I can only go by the, the 14 years that we've been together and we had some very good years with the help of the Lord. And I know he ready to get out to be with his children and grandchildren. And his mother is sickly. He ready to get back with her. I'm quite, I know that. And his uh, sister. So, um, we just praying that everything go well and that he be able to get back out and start all over again. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Next, we'll hear from the mother, Ms. Shirley Jones. Ms. Jones, you need to unmute. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank everybody for, for having me. I'm Alma's mother. Um, looking at my son right now, here now, this day, after uh, being incarcerated, the change that has taken form in him has been a whole 180 degree turn for his life, for his wife, for his children and his grandchildren and his family. Um, Oliver has been, first of all, accepted God to be his number one in his life. Second of all, he has learned what discipline, responsibility, respect, and accountability for anything that he has already done. And I am sure that he has counted many days and many nights of the things that he did before. Those things have been, has been, um, has been forgiven from our almighty God that we serve. And I know that in his heart and his spirit and his mind and his soul that he is now ready to return to society. Um, to be the law by citizen that he is and that he is going to be once he is returned. I know that he is very remorse as to what uh, he did to, um, to Mr. Frank, Mr. Freddie, Mr. Frank, I, I, I don't know his name, um, but um, asking you guys to to please take a long look at him now and what he has already done and accomplished. And to, uh, to make your decision from that. 
I hope you guys have a blessed day, as I will as well. Thank Love you, Ms. Holmes. Next, we'll hear from Jamon Bourgeois. Hello, good morning. How are everyone doing? Please make your statement, sir. Okay. Um, I am Jamon Bourgeois, Oliver's cousin. Um, I'm also a formerly incarcerated citizen as well. I've been free um, 14 years and 12 days of as of today. However, um, I'm a very productive citizen in society. Um, Leona spoke of a blueprint, and I believe that I have a beautiful blueprint for freedom and staying free and being productive in society. Um, I have my own business, Michael Anthony Francis Development, and Michael Francis Anthony Development is a management company where I manage civil projects for all facets of the government, whether it be Army Corps engineer, NAFEC, Federal Highway. I've been um, to three different countries. I've been, since I started my business, I just finished um, rebuilding the North Entrance Gate at Yellowstone National Park. Um, also, along with this company, I have a position for my cousin Oliver. Um, he has um, a maintenance certification where he can maintenance um, my service vehicles. Also, um, I do a numerous amount of work in my community. Um, it's been limited because of COVID, but however, um, I still um, do private mentorship to um, at-risk youth and also um, single parent mothers who have um, kids who've given them problems. Oliver is one of my older cousins. However, I believe that he deserves the opportunity just as I received the opportunity to, you know, just to show um, how productive he can be and the individual that he has grown into. Um, not, only, not only that, um, I have a, I have a, a honorary degree in Christian ministry. I have a associate's degree in drafting and designing. I have a Mr. bachelor's Bourgeois. degree. Mr. Bourgeois, we need you to wrap up, please. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, education is key, and Oliver is an educational man, and I just ask that you guys please um, consider the things he's been through and where he's come. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the opposition. Uh, Mr. Wolf, did you want the victim to speak first, or Ms. Uh, how did y'all want to do this? Yes, ma'am, if we could, I'd like from Mr. Uh, Frey. Mr. Frey, okay. Oh. Mr. Frey, if you'll dial star six to unmute your phone, please. Mr. Frey, we'll need you to dial star six to unmute your phone. There you go. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Can can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so so first off, I know I know time is a constraint and so forth. So I'll try to I'll I'll do my best um, to keep this short and condensed as I can. Um, this is actually the first time I've actually heard them speak and so forth. This was this happened in 2014 as well under under Governor Jindal. Um, I'd just like to take you all back just for a very brief moment um, of them speaking about uh, as a, you know a very religious man and and so forth and so on. Um, in his statement, he and Patrick uh, told the police that they were talking about the Bible before they came out and did what they did to me. That should really kind of be looked at is what we're looking at today. Um, they're, they're speaking about things and changes that he's had uh, over the years uh, and forgiveness and so forth. I'm sorry, it may sound very rough. Forgiveness is between him and God, not between he and I. What I've had to go through and what I continue to go through and the continuous reminders that I have day by day for over 24 years, not including my wife, and what she has to deal with. 
I'd like to take, I'd like you all to take a pen in your hand, in your left hand specifically, and I'd like you to notate the fingers that are holding that pen or pencil. And then I'd like you to train your brain on how to write without being able to feel those fingers. I don't feel the top of my index, my middle, or my thumb because a knife decided to go through it immediately after it started going across my throat. I live with this constantly. I lived with it last night and I live with this over the past 24 years where normally now I've, I've been to been able to identify the trigger of what causes it, but there's nothing I can do about that. We all have stresses in our life, some stronger than others. Usually when that happens, my wife tells me what I do in the bed, tossing, turning, and throwing fists until the point that I wake up and I see him standing on the side of my bed holding a knife, as real as any person near you. He's there. And that lasts for a couple of minutes until my brain apparently decides to shut that off. That's what I go through, among many other things. I, I do fire systems and life, life safety systems and suppression systems. I have to deal with wiring and so forth in my hands. And I've had to train my brain how to grab things without being able to feel them. Um, I know time is short. Uh, but to me, this is a travesty to me that this man is trying to get out again. This was happening in 1998. He filed um, in 2002 under the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, to say that the sentence was unconstitutionally wrong and long, considering the multiple billing was 49 and a half years to 198, and he only got 50, which I guess I can say I'm fine with as long as the 50 is served in consideration for what I have to go through for the rest of my life and the constant reminders that I have day by day that doesn't go away. What this man did is not what was said in those pleadings of him trying to get out. The clear case of him trying to take my life. My only luck is my hand got in the way of it. I don't mean to keep you all. Um, I appreciate everything that the parole board does. I had a very close relationship with Irvin Magri back when all this happened. Um, I hope you all can come to the proper decision on this. To me, it's not very hard. I wish you all luck in it. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Frey. Now we'll hear from David Wolf, ADA from Jefferson. Thank you, David Wolf, on behalf of the state uh, and on behalf of Mr. Frey, uh, I'm standing in for Randy Meyer uh, today. Uh, the, the description of events that Mr. Frey just uh, gave to this board uh, is very different than the account of the offense as uh, written by Mr. Howard in March of 2019. Uh, I think in order to truly be rehabilitated, the first thing you have to do is to accept responsibility uh, for your actions. Uh, and what Mr. Howard wrote in 2019 is that he tried to talk his co-defendant out of committing a robbery. That is co-defendant Patrick Pugh decided to commit a robbery and Mr. Howard tried to talk him out of that. And then when Mr. Uh, Pugh uh, demanded money from Mr. Frey, uh, Mr. Howard was caught off guard. But if you go back to the recorded statement that he gave uh, to the police when he was arrested, they planned the robbery in advance. They talked about they needed money and, and how they were going to get that money was to commit a robbery. And it was Mr. Howard that took a knife from his apartment and took it to the club where they later came upon uh, Mr. Frey. And it was Mr. Howard that put a, a knife to Mr. Frey's neck. And as Mr. Frey pushed that knife away and struggled, then he, he had the 
suffered the injuries that he has just described to you, almost losing his fingers. Uh, he's lucky to be alive today. Yet none of this is in the account of the offense as presented by Mr. Howard. And I believe that should be concerning to the board. It's certainly concerning to me as a representative of the state of Louisiana. We are adamant, adamantly opposed to, to the relief sought by Mr. Howard. We believe he has been mishonest with his statement to the board, and we believe that he is still a risk to society. And, uh, and we thank you for your consideration. Mr. Howard, is there a statement you'd like to make? Yes, ma'am. Today, mostly, I came to apologize to Mr. Frey for hurting him, for hurting his family, for causing any pain, for the pain of the memory of his pain will always be with me. I will always remember that. I wish I could go back and change things, but I can't go backward. But I found that if I would only transform my life and would keep from hurting anyone else, that I would do it. And I have. I've done what it takes to be the man that I've always wanted to be. And so, Mr. Frey, I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't know it was that bad. I wish I could take the pain away from you. I'll just pray that God will heal your hand. I'm sorry for your, the heartache that I caused your wife and your mother. And I just ask your forgiveness. I was young, I was naive, uneducated. And I've learned three things throughout my whole incarceration. That I am a human being that was human doing at that age with a mental problem that needed an education and needed a spiritual awakening. And that's the experience I gained over the 24 years and 16 days today of my incarceration. And I hope that one day you will forgive me and find it in your heart to forgive me. I truly wish that I could, I could help your hand some kind of way. I really do. Thank I you, Mr. About... Howard. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Mr. Scott, would you like to uh, make your presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, board members. Thank you, Mr. Frey. And thank you, uh, uh, David Wolf. Uh, an ADA I've uh, met before. Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to understand how people forgive. I've known Mr. Howard for, for Oliver for quite a while. I've met him through a volunteer job that I uh, have up at uh, Rayburn. Uh, I, I, he's, he's changed so much and people do change. And I believe that is the the purpose of the the board uh, and and the and the the meaning of it is to forgive. I know that uh, a victim of such a horrendous crime can uh, can never find it in their heart. Uh, I've just look at Mr. Howard's record, which is he's done so much to change himself. He's had such a good record, and 
I, I won't keep the board long. I, I know his family. I know he's got a job. He's got a, a wife and home to go, to go to. Uh, and, and I just think of the, uh, those famous lines, uh, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scott. So uh, I think we're prepared to vote. Mr. Wise will be voting first. At this time, I'm gonna be voting to deny. You have a parole eligibility date on 8-1-2021. Uh, because of the Act 122, and you'll be having a hear a, a parole eligibility hearing. But today, I voted to deny for the attachment on the part. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. Uh, my vote, likewise, is going to be the same because you do have that uh, parole eligibility day coming up. Uh, well, it's come, I believe. August the 1st, I believe, is when it is. So my vote would be to deny as well. Ms. Jackson? Likewise, Mr. Howard, because of the proximity of your parole eligibility date, uh, I will vote to deny uh, your request for a commutation. You already have a date. Mr. Roche? Mr. Howard, good morning. Morning. So when you filled out your application, you were seeking relief. You've already received that relief through Act 122 of the Louisiana uh, Legislative Session 2021. You also have adamant victim opposition, and the entire legal community is opposed to this uh, clemency request. Based on those factors, my vote is to deny your request. Mr. Howard, I think uh, you are seeking relief through this, this uh, pardon process. Uh, and we, I see it that you've got the relief, you some relief that you were seeking through Act 122 and that you are now parole eligible. You are not when you made application to the pardon board. Uh, and I think we've already scheduled you a parole hearing. So that would be um, the relief in my eyes that that um, will meet your request. So my vote today also is to deny your pardon application mm -hmm. and uh, you'll see a parole panel in the coming months. Uh, so today, Mr. Howard, your pardon application has been denied. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. There are so many things that are wrong with this that with this hearing, but it, it it you know I'm a broken record on this. How how is it possible that when the supporters of the person who does the crime, how are they so consistently clueless? How are they so consistently seem to have no empathy? How do they always say things that are just so disturbing? talking about how he needs to find forgiveness and talking about it's like shut up it's it's not just it's all the time and then like her like like you couldn't script it any any differently but he has what, his friend or who is he comes there just talking about himself look how great i am i have a business i do this i do that i went to three different countries and he goes on and on and it's like dude what are you saying is it like is it like everyone has to completely lack empathy and forget what it is that you're you're at what you're dealing with how is that even possible but it's not just this hearing we see it consistently across the board supporters of the person locked up just like their head in the clouds and it 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 drives me nuts there are probably fewer than like five hearings that we have seen out of a couple thousand where the supporters seem to be like aware of the pain that was caused 
to the victim. And then, of course, after all that, oh, I travel to countries and I have a job and I, uh, it's like, okay. Um, then the victim starts to speak and you can see that he is still suffering. He has severe PTSD. He, he, it's not just the physical, but it's the trauma that you see. And we'll go over briefly what he did go through. He fought for his life. They don't really touch on the details of it. So we're going to touch on it. We'll spend a little bit of time because we have to jump in for another hearing. And, you know, we're going to be here for a couple hours tonight. So, you know, I wish we could have seen more of Miss Jackson, really. But it was nice to get a Mr. O'Shea mic drop. That is for sure. We'll miss him. Mr. O'Shea. No way, Roche. Can I do it like this? Okay, there we go. And to think it was all because he wanted to give a ride, to do a favor. That is a travesty. Robert Frey, the victim, testified at trial. He stated that on August 7, 1997, he went to shoot pool at the DC lounge with a friend, Rick Hamilton Frey, said that he was getting his pool sticks out of his car. Two individuals approached him and asked if he was DJing that night. Frey identified the two individuals as Patrick, and uh and the defendant oliver Frey responded in the negative and then he went inside dc lounge with hamilton to play pool for a couple of hours Frey testified uh that he and hamilton left dc lounge after that night and went separate cars Frey stated that he got into his car and proceeded to leave with patrick pew approached him pew asked Frey for a ride to fisher um to the fisher projects Frey stated that he would not take him into the Fisher Projects, but that he would drop him off nearby the Sheraton Hotel. As the two were leaving, Pew asked, to, asked Frey if his cousin, Oliver, who was standing nearby, could also have a ride. Frey responded in the affirmative. The defendant got into his passenger back seat of Frey's black Mustang. As they approached the Sheraton, Pew directed Frey to turn into the neighborhood um, next to the hotel. Frey stated that they went... Um, about three blocks, and Pew mentioned him to pull over. According to Frey, Pew got out of the car and asked him if he wanted any money for gas. Frey shook his hands with Pew and said it was no big deal. Frey then testified that the uh, demeanor of voice of Pew changed and everything got serious. So here he is, gives them a ride. They say, hey, you want money for gas? He says, don't worry about it. And this is one, the flip switches. According to Frey, Pugh stated, well, how about we take all you've got? Frey explained that at first he thought it was a joke. And then he looked um, at the back seat at the defendant and Frey testified that Pugh told him, don't look back there real firmly. Don't look back there. Frey handed his wallet, which only contained $8, five, um, a $5 bill and three $1 bills. Frey handed Pugh the wallet. Pugh stated, my boy, in the backs going to take care of you with a knife. <laughs> you know? Frey testified that that he then felt his head jerk back and something slicing across his throat. When you put it this way, it just changes everything. It really does. They were taking his life for the fun of it. Like to from the backseat to grab someone's head and pull a knife to your throat because he gave them a ride and for eight dollars for nothing and it really adds emphasis when you read this about how little empathy they all have and how like so oblivious they are to how terrible this was and thank goodness the da was there um you know randy meyer wasn't able to make it but they sent the backup Frey explains um, he grabbed the knife and pushed it away. Frey explained that he then leaned over the top of his center console with his head facing the back seat. He testified that few and the defendant were hitting him. Frey stated that he reached into the console and got his 380. So he, he was armed. And this is what I meant when he fought for his life. He chambered around and fired a shot at the passenger window. And this, of course, can be the whole argument of whether you carry with around in the chamber or not, but that's a different... He was able to chamber it. He fired a shot 
at the passenger window. Frey stated that he then rolled out of the car on the driver's side because he thought few might have been coming around the other side of the vehicle to get him. I know I'm pronouncing this name wrong. Pew, few, pa, probably pew. Frey said that as he rolled out of the car onto the ground, the defendant was hanging onto him. According to Frey, when he um, was on the ground, his car rolled over to his right side. He explained that he never placed his vehicle in park, but that he only had his foot on the brake. Frey testified that the defendant was on his back and they were both fighting over control of the gun. The police showed up at the scene as the two were struggling. Luckily, the police showed up, right? I mean, it must have been just right place, right time. The whole thing probably took seconds. And immediately handcuffed them both. Frey testified that the police separated the two and he felt blood trickling down his hand. Frey stated they sustained lacerations to his hand and neck and cuts and bruises to his face, chest, back, and elbows. Frey also testified that his car kept rolling down the street during the struggle. There were scratches on the rear bumper. The passenger door bent all the way forward towards the front wheel. Um, Frey um, identified the state's exhibit. So we're going to stop here and we can continue later on. And again, because we have another hearing. Um, you give someone a ride and all of a sudden you're fighting for your life. And he did. He fought for his life and he won his life. Um, but as you can see, he still is suffering tremendously. And thank you for the Mr. O'Shea mic drop. But then another point here is that, so he applied for commutation, but because of Act 122, next year he has a parole hearing, which is what we're about to watch. So they denied his commutation, but anyways, because of Act 122, he has a parole hearing. So what project do you think is going to show up at this parole hearing? And remember, Act 122 was lobbied to go through legislation by the parole project because it diverted tens of millions of dollars from the prison system to the parole project. Wow. Are they a not-for-profit doing it for the good of their heart? Or is it like a, just another way of getting taxpayer dollars into a different vehicle? But anyways, that's a different story for a different day. Let's see if anything changes in this parole hearing. With that, let's jump in. Parole day, August 1st, 2021. Good time, April 8th, 2047. Full term, August 6th, 2047. Is this information correct, sir? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Howard, your case was assigned to me, so I'll, I'll start off with the interviewing. How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Doing well, good, good to hear. I'm just going to start off with what I think is the obvious. Uh, if you had came before us and you were at state police, you know, things would be different. So what happened with state police and you got removed? I had a medical condition. Um, IBS, so I was, I had to, it's a work uh, facility, so they transferred me here to take care of my medical. Okay, now, I, but I, but the write-up you got, they said you were malingering, right, on, on a sick call. That's what we said. Uh, the report, the doctor's reports was, uh, I had to be transferred from one hospital to another hospital, from Lane to Osler. And that being said, the doctor made that call. And when I took the, uh, I took an angiogram and the angiogram came back negative from what the doctor thought he saw on the CAT scan. Mm -hmm. And so I was told that I, I lied. Mm -hmm. So okay. I wouldn't lie about my medical, that's for sure. Oh, okay. You would you would lie about what you were experiencing. Of course. Yeah, well, that's what you're saying. Uh, because yes. the, uh, the write-up was at Oshner's, but you said you went somewhere else? I was transferring a helicopter from Lane Hospital to Oshner. Oh, okay. Okay. And the hospital at Lane thought that it was necessary to transfer you to Oshner's. Correct, correct. Okay, okay. My, my, my. How are you doing now? I haven't had that episode. I had it twice there at the barracks. One time in August and the second time in November. That's when mm -hmm. I was transferred. But I haven't had those episodes since I've been here. So okay. I'm doing pretty good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank and you. that, 
Yeah, that's that's what really matters. Right? And I also see that uh, <clears throat> you got outstanding letters of commendations when you were at your work site. All kind of uh, favorable letters. I want to just you know state that for the record. Uh, letters of reference. And since you've been at Hunt, you got a letter from you know your workstation now. Yes, uh, about what outstanding uh, worker that you are. Uh, <clears throat> so tell us what was going on in your life. But we'll call out for the record how long you've served. 24 years, five months, and five days today. Yeah. So what was going on in your life past 25 years ago? Who was that person? When I came to prison, I was 25 years old, lost, distraught, uneducated, no type of skills. And I knew that I had to do something about that because I hurt someone and I didn't want that to happen again. And I started early, as soon as I got incarcerated. I started in the parish. I knew I had an alcohol problem. I got in AA. Alcohol Anonymous, and when I left the parish, I jumped immediately into school once I got to Angola. And I got my GED, I got different certifications. Um, I got into the Bible College. I got vocational skills. So I've done what I needed to do in order to educate myself to realize that a good citizen will not only educate themselves, but they will abide by the law of the land and understand that when you abide by the law, you know that you have to be a part of that community. And that's what I, I, I expect to do. I expect to be a part of the community, to help out, to do what I need to do to help those that may have been in my situation and 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 help them to turn their lives around as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> you got married in 2011. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, are you guys still together? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, good. 14 good. years. 14, 14 years, years together. Yes, ma'am. All right. And, uh, <clears throat> and as you said, you graduated from the Bible college. You got a... a degree in May of 2010, and you are in college now, is that correct? No, ma'am, not now. Uh, when I left the police barracks, I was in uh, the electrical school they had there at uh, Baton Rouge Community College. So I got a certification uh, in electrical, level one and two. When I got here, of course, coronavirus hit, so really couldn't get in school. So. I started doing what I like doing. I, I like mechanic work. And I've done that for three years while I was at the barracks. When I came here, the warden put me over at ASNR, which is a mechanic shop. Okay. I went from there to the uh, to the warden's building. Okay. Okay. Good, good. It's, uh, I, there's nothing you can do about this, but I do want to inform you that there's law enforcement opposition, the judge, the sheriff's office, uh, the DA is here, so you'll hear from him in, in a minute, but there's opposition uh, to your early release, and there's some victim opposition to your to your early release. Uh, again, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, I like that uh, you don't sound like you, you're too upset about uh, what happened with, with the uh, with the, with the state police? I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You don't sound like you got a chip on your shoulder about it. No, ma'am. Uh, you said that you you started working on your substance abuse when you first got in. If you're successful today, what's your plan to stay clean and sober? Well, I'm a minister, so I like to I like to preach and. Uh... I like to just enjoy God's word and he sent me a good wife and I, I had problems with alcohol. So I, I, I was wanting to have something to fill a void. And I had a void that was filled since my incarceration in the last 14 years. So that was my wife. And uh, 
we look to do things together and stay focused that's that way uh church travel a little uh things like that so uh you don't see that aa or na meetings or anything like that you would need i would like to stay involved with the parole project if possible to you know do whatever i need to do to stay to stay clean because i I am a recovery alcoholic, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. That's all I had. That's all I had, Chief. Thank you, Ms. Wise. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Mr. Roche has his hand up. I'm sorry, Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Oliver. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Roche. I'm good. Good. Are you pronouncing it Oliver or Olivier? Oliver. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I see that you applied for a commutation of sentence in 2019. Yes, sir. Um, did you ever have a hearing? Yes, sir, I did. No, you did August the 23rd. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what was the result? Uh, I got denied because I had a uh, parole. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you had a proximity of a, a parole date because of Act 122? That's correct, sir. Okay. Now, Ms. Wise asked you a question. What was going on 25 years ago that caused Mr. Oliver to um, accost a man in his own car. Once you in a car, you requested that he stop again and let your cousin in, and then you mm -hmm. used a knife that you have and tried to rob the individual. What was going on? Was it drugs involved or it was just a premeditated attempt to uh, take the belongings of another individual? That's exactly what it was. I, it was a selfish, um, it was stupid, it was selfish, it was... Mm. I did something to someone that mm -hmm. I would have never thought I would have done to. I've done it. And I understand that when you do things that, to hurt other people, there are results that are consequences to that. I would have never thought that uh, someone would give me a ride, you know, they would help me and I would hurt them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but I did that in, uh, mm -hmm. You only had three arrests on your record and all of them involves theft, possession of stolen things, simple robbery, and then you moved up to armed robbery in 1988, 1996, 1997. It's not a lengthy criminal record, but it's a significant because you committed an armed robbery. Yes, sir. In the state of Louisiana, you could have gotten 99 years. And you were fortunate to get a lesser sentence. What would you tell Mr. Frey right now if you could speak to him? I would tell him that I was a young, uneducated, foolish young man who didn't know who I was. And that I am so very sorry for hurting him. I'm so very sorry for that. I've done the things that I needed to do in my life to correct that. 
that behavior. I made bad choices early on in my life, even from 12 years old. And I believe and I know that I've come a long way from hurting Mr. Furry. And I just want to tell him I'm sorry. And I also want to apologize to my first victim of the simple robbery. I never had a chance to apologize to him as well. And, and you don't need to answer me, but do you realize that if Mr. Frey was a individual that seeked out opportunities to help his community, Correct. you've taken that away from him? I realize that. And he, after will, ne he will never help another person in distress because of what you did. I understand. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. You. Chairman, I, I neglected to ask the warden for this input. After yeah. my interview, I apologize, sir. Warden, warden could, could you give us some input on uh, Mr. Uh, Howard? Mr. Oliver, as he said, has uh, progressed from ASNR, which is the shop that takes care of our automotive um the vehicles and he works in the administration building where obviously my office is the rest of the deputy wardens your uh, system wardens of uh the business office and security and since i've been back at home as a warden i think i met oliver here he's been consistent and there i mean that that area we don't have time to directly uh supervise the offenders that are assigned and entrusting them to come into our offices take care of their um their duties, their business, and go back into their quarters until they're called on. And he is consistent with doing that. He uh, works more with Deputy Warden Campbell on that side of the administration building. But since I've been back here for what, seven months now, I've never heard anyone that was uncomfortable with his presence or him being present in the office to take care of business in their absence. So uh, he's been consistent in that regard. Right. Thank you, Warden. Thank you for your comments. Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Teresa. First, we will hear from Mr. Perry Myers, Louisiana Pearl Project. Um, good morning. Kerry uh, Myers, Louisiana Pearl Project. Um, you know, the 25 year old Mr. Howard is, is not the, the 50 year old Mr. Howard that's sitting before you today. Um, he is certainly remorseful for his actions. He understands that, you know, his life was spiraling. Uh, alcohol played a big role in that. Uh, he has taken substance abuse and living in balance, anger management, victim awareness. He certainly has developed that sense of empathy for his victims and he understands. Uh, we will, uh, we are supporting Mr. Howard. We will, he will be in our program. He will go through where he will develop the skills that he needs uh, through our program to reintegrate into society. And I know this board's very familiar, so I won't just list all the things that, that we do, uh, but we will make sure he has a substance abuse evaluation uh, as part of that. And if any recommendation and to follow any recommendation of that substance abuse evaluation, he has a strong reentry plan through Parole Project and his wife uh, re residing in Hammond. He has uh, skills. He's, he's certified in electrical one and two. He has uh, employment with an HVAC uh, service company uh, awaiting him. Um, he's been a trustee uh, since 2005, uninterrupted. Even the transfer did not interrupt his trustee status. So I think that tells you something about that situation, Ms. Pearl. Uh, and I believe that he's recognized early on through, through acquiring his GED and through all the programming, graduating from and OBTS and all the additional, uh, he's done what he needs to do to prepare himself. Uh, even before he thought he had this chance with Act 122, he was preparing himself, not just for an opportunity to leave, but to be a better person. And so we would ask this board today to, to look at this better person that's just before you today uh, and grant him parole and parole project will ensure that, that he has the transition he needs. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Next, we will hear from Ms. Bridget McGee, sister. 
Good morning. I'd like to acknowledge everyone. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, um, I just wanted to um, say that um, over 24 years ago, two families were changed, both emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, we all transformed and, and not by choice. The victim and my brother also changed. One to shame, disgrace, and loss of freedom. The other to sleepless, restless nights and fear. Either way, what took place within minutes caused the result that is still in effect. Yet there is hope in, uh, in acknowledging that. I am shamelessly asking the court parole board for mercy, and consideration, grace of time served, and for the transformation that happened, that has happened to my brother since he's been in there for 24 years. And to the victim, I can only ask for his forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Mr. Robert McGee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Oliver's brother-in-law. But from the moment Oliver and I have met, we've been more like brothers. We have always had a close relationship. So when this situation happened, of course, it deeply affected all of us. Um, I can honestly say uh, my wife and I have been the victim of a violent issue. Uh, we were both shot, we both hospitalized, and had recovered, so we know the feelings of the victim and having to go through that you know, nightmares and repercussions. So we sympathize with the victim, his family, and all of his friends and everyone connected to him. We pray for his well-being, we pray that God gives him a peace and comfort beyond anything he's working for. I do know that my brother Oliver has always regretted his actions on that day. He's always told me he wished he had stayed home instead of going out on that fateful night. That fateful night that changed everyone's life connected to him and the victim, Mr. Fred. That one choice has totally changed his life, for sure. So we sympathize with the victim. We pray for him and his family and their continued growth through this process. Uh, to the victim and his family and friends, and to you, the parole board, I pray you find it in your heart. Grant my brother his freedom, so that he can be the source of strength, love, and peace to everyone in his life, but from beyond the walls of prison. I pray for favor, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. McGee, for your comments as well. Ms. Teresa? Next, we will hear from Ms. Leona Howard, who's your wife. Ms. Howard, if you'll unmute your microphone, please. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Leona Howard. I'm Oliver Howard's wife. We met 14 years ago, and when we first met, we met on a spiritual uh, meeting at the um, at Angola. And all of us said that I always put God first. But we got into our relationship. He asked that I pray and let God lead me, whether to be in a relationship or not. He's a very remorseful young man. Um, we pray about Mr. Uh, Frey because we didn't know it was bad as it was, but we, we were very sorry for, for how it happened. And we saw that it did happen. And we pray that his family and him be able to forgive us. Since I'm Oliver's wife, we are one. 
And when he heard, I heard. So we pray that Mr. Frey and his family, his wife, the sleepless night that they have, the nightmares or whatever, that God would uh, just heal his hand to where he can use it as he used to. We are very sorry. And it's nothing we could do but ask for his forgiveness and his wife and his family and that uh, he be able to forgive. And that uh, and I know that won't be easy, but we are asking him in Jesus' name that he will forgive, that God will forgive him or his family for whatever else they need to be forgiven for. And we, um, we stand as one, believing that God, he never fails. He don't make mistakes. So whatever this situation is, we know that when Oliver get out, we gonna do the best we can to help those on the street to keep from going into prison as he have, to keep from doing crime and live a life before them that's pleasing to God to help them stay on the, the straight and narrow. And I ask that um, you all take all this information into consideration and that we all continue to pray for Mr. Frey and his family. We are so deeply sorry. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Howard, for your comments. Ms. Teresa? We will now hear from the opposition side. We will start with Mr. Robert Frey, who's the victim. I've um, been listening, which I really didn't do a whole lot of in most of these hearings, and I've gone to many of them over the years. There's some things I've heard today that infuriate me, to be honest. You know, in the record, I don't know if y'all have looked back far enough. Statements made what he and Mr. Pugh were doing prior to this were reading the Bible and discussing God. Before they decided to do what they did to me. I constantly live with this. I constantly go through this. And I followed this from 1997, of course, 98, 2003, 2005, 2007, and the continuations of filings upon filings for him to be released. But yet I hear I'm remorseful. I don't hear that. I hear something to myself of what wants to be said to be released. I don't feel that he is truly swallowed, accepted anything that he has done. One of the board members I heard say something today that is extremely true. I trust only one person in my life who's sitting right next to me right now. And no one else. I can't. I don't know how. Having it being taken away from me is words to use. It's a little bit more than that. But yet we're here only halfway through a sentence that should have been four times longer. 
discussing a release of someone who, I'm sorry, you all may not see it, but I do, who doesn't have any remorse for this. He hasn't swallowed this and he hasn't accepted it. If there was, I'd be perfectly honest with you. I'd consider it with you, but it's not there. It's the first time I've seen him on video because I cared not to prior, even at the personal hearing in Baton Rouge many years ago. I could see it in his eyes that it's not there. And like I said, I'd be honest with you and tell you if I saw it, but it's not. I know you all have very hard decisions you all have to make. No one is easier than another, I'm sure. I hope you all can make the right one today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frey, for your comments, sir. Next, we will hear from Mr. Randy Meyer, Jefferson ADA. Uh, good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, our position on Mr. Uh, Howard is we are opposed to his request. As you've heard, there's very strong victim opposition, and we stand with the victim on that. Some of my concerns uh, also are in Mr. Howard's application to the pardon board. Um, the facts that he set forth in that application concerning the offense was not, was completely um, different than the facts that were developed for trial, showing that he was a willing participant and this was something that, that they had planned, um, not, not a uh, spur of the moment thing. And, 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 he, and the statement he also had regarding the use of the weapon that he had, the knife that he had, uh, is completely different from the facts. And that concerns me. His answer to Ms. Wise's question uh, concerning um, what's your plan to stay off of alcohol if you get out and when you get out, that concern. His responses were that I'm a minister. Well, there are ministers who have substance abuse problems uh, and he has a wife that's gonna help him. He didn't say that he was gonna continue with his uh, substance abuse treatment with the AA and NA programs until Ms. Wise asked him about that. And then, he, then he acknowledged that that was something he was gonna do. Um, it'd have been much better in my eyes if he would have, if that would have been the first thing he said, because uh, that's the first thing that he needs to, to do in order to remain sober. Looking at the, the institutional record, shows that he is backlogged for cage or age, living in balance and nurturing parent. And uh, the offender assessment report says he needs vocational skills. Um, I have a, a, you know, he hasn't had many programs completed since 2018. That's really the last thing he did except for the victim accountability letter training. And I, I did see that he had the uh, BRCC workforce training, uh, two certificates for that. Um, and, and the 2019 malingering write-up, although there was a not guilty finding on that, that also gave me some concern. So for those reasons, um, we will stand with Mr. Frey and remain opposed to his request. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Ms. Teresa, do we have any other speakers? No, sir. Mr. Howard, is there anything you'd like to say before the panel votes? Yes, sir. I would like to say that if there's anything else that I need to do, I want to do it. Whatever it takes, I want to do it. And if it's okay with the district attorney, I would love to take care of Mr. Frey's medical bill for his hand by month, I would do that. And I would also take care of the bill for his, his vehicle. I caused 
the harm to his hand and I cause the harm to his vehicle. Uh, I would love to make monthly payments. Uh, if, if it's okay with the board and, and, and the district attorney. And uh, I'm very, 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 very sorry. And I, I will, I will do better. I will do better. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Appreciate yep. your comments. Is the board ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Wise? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Howard, as an uh, individual on this board, very experienced in addiction, and he always says that it's a disease. It's a, it is in a disease. You did admit that you are a recovered addict, but I don't think you have a true sense of what the disease is. And uh, and that and as has already been said, you and clergy is very important that you know about the the disease factor of addiction because that's what you're going to be coming in contact with. Uh, absent a, a long term substance abuse treatment program where you have time to reflect and really work on you and get get honest before you know, about you. Uh, my vote today is to deny. We have the, the victim opposition, the strong victim opposition, but I think you need more programs. You have 120 days of programs. There's room for a lot more programs. And you're a young man. You got a 50 year sentence. Uh, I know you don't see it that way, but you're a young man. So you have time to come back before us. Uh, and, and it's concerning with me with what happened at, at, at state police. And that's very concerning to me uh, as well. But my vote is to deny. I'm just not inclined to take a chance on you today. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Mr. Rochette. Mr. Howard, I have the same vote, but for different reasons. As a victim's advocate on this committee of parole, I have to stand with the victim. Mr. Frey is still emotionally affected. He's mentally affected. And because of his hand, he's physically affected by a crime that was committed almost 25 years ago. You have strong opposition from even the sentencing judge. And the judge in these cases probably 85% of the time, he doesn't even respond, but he felt a need to respond in your case. We have opposition from the DA's office, which you heard today. We have opposition from the sheriff's office. We have opposition from the chief of police of Gretna, Louisiana. And as Ms. Wise said, that you need to take a look within yourself. You have a problem. You are an addict. And you address that and realize the magnitude of that problem. You just might repeat what you did if you get on a bench. And as she stated, I'm not willing to take that chance. So I'm going to vote to, to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Mr. Howard, uh, I've listened very intently to everyone here as one should when we're having such a hearing. And in a lot of what we do, is very similar to what I did before, and that was to be a judge and to try to listen to credibility and try to listen to what we're hearing people say and, and, and how honest they are and how sincere they are. Uh, I don't hear a whole lot of remorse in you for what you did and recognition of the responsibility of what you did. I mean, you know, you're willing to pay for his car, pay for his medical bills. Uh, you know, you very much downplayed 
the facts of this case. I mean, I read the facts and my notes reflect. This doesn't, your application doesn't reflect what a jury found. And uh, you're very articulate and you've done very well education wise. You know the words and you know what to say. I just don't know that you feel them deep inside yet. So based upon all of the things my colleagues have already said, and the fact that I don't believe that you've truly taken responsibility for what you've done, because it looks like, uh, you know, you're downplaying what you did. And, and that's not the case. This was a horrible crime. And we have a man who has been suffering ever since. So my vote likewise is to deny. And I would hope that you could take some substance abuse, a long-term substance abuse course that will, in addition to that, allow you to look introspectively into yourself and see what real harm you've done. And that would assure me the next time, if you come before this board and I'm on it, that I might be willing to give you a chance. But as of today, that answer is no. So my vote likewise is to be den to deny. We have three votes to deny your parole. Good luck to you, sir, and I encourage you to continue to work hard. Thank you. Another another emotional statement by the victim, another mic drop by Mr. Roche. And this time we got to see our, uh, our Randy Meyer. We're about to see another parole hearing Fast forward to April 3rd, 2024, when he comes up again against the new parole board members. We have Ms. Renatza, but we're also going to have the sheriff and the preacher. I'm curious if it will be any different. But before we do that, <clears throat> let's jump in to finish this these, these documents. So, and thank you, Richard, for providing it all. And it's actually quite a lot on this case that Richard provided, but I'm keeping it down to this just because of how long these hearings are. I don't know how much more we can stretch it out, but so if you remember, he, um, they uh, had gone into the, the car uh, when he dropped them off. The co-defendant got out and said, uh, you're not, don't look back at him. Then, then he had jumped in with the knife and he was fighting for his life. He pulls out the gun, he shoots. Um, please come put both of them in handcuffs. And um, and then we're going to continue from there. So Frey identified the state's exhibit 8A, B, C, D, and E, where picture is depicted the damage to his vehicle. Frey also stated that he found the knife blade stuck underneath the seat of his vehicle. He explained that he found the blade a couple of weeks later. This is so bizarre to me by the way that the police do such a bad investigation that he finds the knife not the police like are you serious he explained that um he found the blade a couple of weeks later after his car was fixed and then he turned the blade over to police again that's just insane Officer Scott Vincent of the city of Gretna Police Department testified that on August 8, 1997, at 2.30 a.m., he responded to a call regarding the fight in the street of 900 block of Roman Street. <laughs> that he arrived at the scene, the defendant was fray on Frey's back, and they were fighting over a gun. He explained that both individuals were screaming, he's trying to kill me. So the police officer really had no idea what's going on. Um, one man with a the gun, they're both yelling. He's trying to kill me. Vincent exited his vehicle, kicked the gun away, and, and immediately detained Frey. This could have gone so much more. I mean, the police officer, of course, could have shot him. Can you imagine? He stated that Officer Pretty, uh, the assisting officer, detained the defendant. Vincent separated Frey, and the defendant advised them of their constitutional rights. After separating the two, Vincent learned that Frey was the victim of an armed robbery with a knife. Vincent testified that Frey had lacerations on the neck and straight lacerations on the hands across the fingers, which indicated a struggle with the knife. He stated that the defendant was then arrested. Uh, Vincent testified that he found blood on the passenger seat of Frey's vehicle, but didn't look under the seat for a knife. No, that's 
yeah, anyways. The passenger's window was shattered and the car was found damaged in a yard nearby. Vincent located a black kitchen knife handle at the scene in the street. Vincent also testified that Pew was found around the corner with a gunshot wound to the chest, holding $8 in his left hand. This is almost comical. So good for the survivor. He got a shot off and hit him. And now he's sitting there holding eight measly dollars. And he's shot in the chest. Shot in the chest over eight measly dollars. It's insane. Explain that phrase. Mother later brought the, the knife blade found in the vehicle to the police station. Detective Wayne Lawrence of the Gretna Police Department testified that he took statements from the victim and the defendant. Detective Lawrence advised the defendant of, the, of his constitutional rights, and he executed a waiver of rights form, which the defendant signed. Detective Lawrence testified that the defendant's statement was audio taped and transcribed. This tape was played to the jury. He explained that after the defendant gave a statement, he was arrested for armed robbery. So what was his statement? And remember, we're going to go and watch the next hearing in a minute or two. The defendant's statement was taken on August 7, 1997 at 5.18 a.m. In the statement, the defendant said that, that Pew got together after work. Now, this is his version of events, right? And drank a few beers. The defendant admitted that while they were drinking beer, they planned on robbing someone that night in order to make some money. They decided to go to D.C. Lounge, and prior to leaving the apartment complex, the defendant grabbed a black-handled knife. Man. What a dumb move. The defendant said that they went to DC Lounge to shoot pool. However, he claimed that they never shot pool that night because the tables were occupied. He then said that they left the DC Lounge to cross the street to Danny and Clyde's store to buy beer because it was cheaper. He and Pew sat outside the DC Lounge and drank beer. Can you imagine if you have a lounge and people are, are hanging outside your lounge drinking the groceries for beer? Um, the defendant alleged in his statement that he told Pew that he was having second thoughts about robbing someone, stating, I'm not really too sure about this. The defendant then said that he and Pew separated in front of the lounge. The defendant said Pew later showed up and phrased car. Pew told him to get into the car and they had a, um, and they had a ride. The defendant said that he sat in the back passenger seat. The defendant claimed that Frey was still driving the car. Pew demanded money from him by saying, give it up. He then said that Frey slowed down and reached into his pocket. According to the defendant, after Frey went in his pocket, Frey produced a gun and fired a shot. Remember, this is his story of events. When the defendant heard the gunshot, he and Frey looked like he was going to shoot him. He said that he grabbed Frey's wrist while holding the knife. They began to struggle, and the defendant said that he lost the knife during the scuffle. Later in the statement, the defendant said that he held the knife to Frey between the time a pew said give it up and the time the gun went off. Um, the defendant admitted that he and pew was attempting to rob Frey. After hearing the trial testimony considering the evidence, the jury found the defendant guilty by a vote of 12 to 0. So... We're going to stop going through this now because it's really just the different appeals. But um, we're also going to learn about in this next hearing what the co-defendant got, which is really just a little slap on the wrist. But maybe that's because he already had a bullet in the chest. Let's see how the sheriff and the preacher handle this one. Mr. Howard, you're classified as a second felony offender. You're currently serving a 50-year sentence as a habitual offender, sentenced in 1999 in Jefferson Parish for armed robbery. Your parole eligibility date was August 1st, 2021. You do have an adjusted good time date, which is July 12th, 2046. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, your case has been assigned to Mr. Prater. Would you answer his questions, please? Yes, sir. How are you doing, Mr. Howard? Um, how old are you right now? I'm 43 years old, sir. And when you got arrested, how old were you? I'm sorry, I'm 53 years old. <laughs> <laughs> 53, I'm sorry. 
And when you were arrested, how old were you? I was 25. Okay. And how many crimes had you done up to that point that you were caught doing and, and, and to be considered a habitual offender? There was the uh, simple robbery and car theft. Okay, in the simple robbery, how old were you then? 17. And the car theft? I believe I was in my 20s. Okay, and then this offense, uh, the armed robbery, how old were you? About 25. Okay, I think you answered that already. All right. Um, and the fellow that was with you that did the armed, armed robbery, the one that actually got shot, during the armed robbery, but he was also a, a committed the armed robbery. Uh, and he, I believe I remember reading that he actually had the money, the small amount of money. And when he, they found him down the street shot, he still had the money with him. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And how much time did he get? Five years. So he got five and you got 50. Yes, sir. But part of, part of yours was because of the two previous offenses. The first sentence was 35 years, and then a multi-building gave me 50. Do you know why you got 35 initially for the armed robbery that he got five on? Probably because I had a weapon. Okay. Okay, let's move on from that to, to your conduct. How is your conduct record? I have two write-ups from 2003 and a previous one that was dismissed in 2019 from the police barracks. Okay. And uh, so I, I commend you for that because I'm, I'm learning a lot about, about these reports that we read. Some people have... 50, 60, 150, 200. And for you to have that small amount, that says something. I also was, I also was impressed with the fact that you immediately, when I say immediately, very early in your prison career, you began taking training and trying to improve yourself and to do things like that. Uh, and I want to commend you for that. I was, I was impressed with that. Thank uh, you. So, uh, Anyway, that's uh, that's about all that I had. All right. Um, <clears throat> what is your job now, uh, Mr. Howard? Yes, uh, I work for the Warren Administration Building. And what do you do? I take care of the building, take care of whatever needs to be done. I, I, I asked that question because we do have letters in the record from several people that work in that area. They commending you for your for the work that you do. So that's uh, I know that's a highly uh, high security area, I guess, if you will. So I'm glad you uh, did well there. Um, the last time you were heard was in January of 2022, and I'm looking at the notes and and the, what you were denied, and it said need these are some of the reasons that were noted for the denial need for long-term substance abuse treatment there was strong opposition strong victim opposition um does note that you had uh the parole project behind you then and you had a good institutional record but there was a lot of opposition and the need for treatment so since your hearing that was january 5th of 2022 what classes have you taken since then I've taken AANA for a year now. I've taken three NA um, to 12 steps. I've done a 60 day program as well. And I've done a cage of rage, living in balance, trauma healing. Good. All right, so you listen to what they what they recommended for you. Now, are you a Bible college graduate? Yes, ma'am, with a Bachelor of Social Degree in Christian Ministry. And you got that back in 2010? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I think that's the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Okay, good. 
All right. Uh, let's see, Warden, is there anything you can add or tell us about Mr. Howard? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, like, like you said, he does. He is a trustee. He works in the administration building around, you know, all the wardens, uh, you know, all the uh, eight-hour staff, the administrative staff. Uh, I mean, he's got an impeccable record. Uh, you know, he he helps the MA population with different things. Uh, as a mentor. Um, you know, uh, no write-ups for since 2003. Uh, so uh, he's he's been a model uh, offender here. Oh, good. Thank you. We appreciate hearing from you. So let's hear from the folks who want to speak on behalf of Mr. Howard. Um, first, we, Mr. Myers, who we hear from the Parole Project. Uh, good morning, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, here for for Oliver Howard. We were uh, with Mr. Howard at his at his 2022 hearing, uh, and uh, we continue to support him. His transition uh, to parole project will provide him with um, the mentoring and the and the, the programming he needs, uh, technology. Uh, he'll learn how to um, use his phone. He'll learn how to do things like online banking, things that that have changed in the in the 25 plus years he's he's been incarcerated. He'll get he'll learn social norms. He'll understand uh, things like consumer skills. Uh, he'll have access to our social worker where he'll get an evaluation and uh, we would ensure that he follows any recommendations from that evaluation. Uh, Mr. Howard has done the work that the board asked him to do two years ago um, and his record is impeccable. So we would just ask this board to consider all that today. Thank you. Um, Mr. Banford. I, th I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Do you show him as being on mute? He, he's still on mute. You're still on mute. I think that's, you? there you go. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. How you all doing? I'm just, I was just listening to, to Howard and I remember we graduated in 2010. And at that time it was a it was a troublesome time for me because my brother had died that year. And Howard found himself encouraging me and motivating me to keep going. And we know sometimes with a Bible college class would be real stream with on us and it could take so much from us, but he kept encouraging me to go forward and it helped me out. He's always been that type of individual, always been the motivator. He um, He's great with working with his hands. He's always helpful. I've never seen him really down um, throughout his incarceration as we met we met while in Angola. But he's always been helpful, an excellent individual. And even when his family would come see him and everything, he tried to make everybody else feel loved, even if their family didn't come. I didn't often get visits, but he always made me feel like I was a part of him. And that's one of the great things about him. He always wanted to make you feel included, make you want to feel like you're important. And um, with that, I think a lot of that came from his growth and development, came through seminary, came with him passing the church, came with him wanting to be more than what people thought he could actually be. And I greatly appreciate Oliver Howard. He's, you know, uh, you have a lot of people that's responsible for my growth and development throughout my incarceration. And I proudly say that he was one of them. Uh, the way that he smiled, he just keeps you going. He makes you want to do more than what you do. And that's one of the things that I greatly appreciate about him. And hopefully today, I hope the board could see that he has made a change for the better and that he has gotten himself together and that he's able to be an asset to society. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak. I believe in Oliver Howard and any assistance that he may need once he's home. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help him do whatever it needs that he needs to get done. Right, good. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Mr. Amade. You're still on mute. Yes. Um, can y'all hear me? How y'all yes. doing? Um, thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Howard. 
Um, I've known Howard for over 20 years. Um, when I was incarcerated in Angola as well, Howard and I, we always came into the same circles. Uh, he and I share a passion for um, sewing and he has always been a type of person that I've known to always try to improve upon himself. You know, he's uh, he's been consistent in that, you know, throughout the years that I've known him, even when I was in Angola. Um, like I said, me and him, we met through all the different like educational circles, you know, even through hobby craft. Um, also, when I was doing time at the state's police barracks, Howard came and I started training in Howard to do alterations in tailoring. And he caught on really well. And I was training him to you know, work at the governor's mansion for that job. So I wind up getting out and I promised him, I say, you know, you get out. I say, I got a job for you. So I have my own alteration shop, my own alteration shop a minute now. And I got so much business here in Hammond and I need some help. And Howard would be the prime candidate. He has a good personality and he can find full time job, a full time job here. He has that he has that type of character that he can, you know, encourage people, you know, to um, be better. And I'm just hoping that I get a chance to work with him out here. You know, I hope the board will really consider that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Uh... Okay, uh, Mr. Howard, before we ask Ms. Alpine Aaron, I'll say it that way, I'm sorry. Uh, for her presentation, is there a statement you'd like to make to us? And then we'll ask the DA's office to close it out for. Her. Yes, ma'am. Today is a, is a day that I feel like everybody should have an open ear. It's not everything that I've done that made the best of me, that made the best come out of me. It's the choice I made. I made a bad choice at the age of 25, and I hurt a good man because he was only trying to give me a ride home. And I hurt him, and I'm very sorry for that. Once I made the choice to start rehabilitation, I focused more on myself to get myself straight before I actually knew the harm that I caused Mr. Ferdy. I didn't know it was as harsh as it was until I heard him speak for the first time. And it hurt me to the depths of my soul for three nights, I cried three nights. And I shared that with my wife and I shared it with some Christian brothers of mine. And I feel like today is not all about me, it is about my victim. And I wanna to apologize to him for his suffering, for the change that I made his life to be. I'm sorry for the suffering that his family had to endure. I'm, so, I'm sorry for causing the state trouble. I'm sorry for causing anybody, any harm or any difficulty in their lives. This, Everything that I've done before my incarceration was not good. And I feel like when I look back over my life and I see all the wrong that I've done, and then I look forward in my life and see all the things that I've done to improve myself, I feel like that person that I was, is, there's someone out there that was like me that maybe I could talk to and encourage them 
to help them to not come here, to help them to get their life on track. And one more thing I would like to say as well, Keith Amadee has a contract with the Hammond Sheriff Department, and he does alterations for the Sheriff Department. I have plans in my mind to continue uh, my connections with the Sheriff Department to maybe speak with young kids that they're having trouble with in that community as well. So I had that in mind. I, I really would want to do that. And I just want to thank the board. I thank you, Mr. Prater, Mr. Tillis, and I thank you, Mr. Noss, and everybody involved. So how, when, if, uh, if you're successful, you would live in what parish after you finish parole project? I will be, my wife and I have a home in Hammond, Louisiana. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Alpandadar? We're ready for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you to this committee for allowing me to speak on Oliver's behalf today. Um, I think Oliver's record is a great indicator of the man he is today, you know, only having two write-ups and both of those in 2003. Um, today, Oliver comes before you, a husband, father, grandfather, a mentor, a churchgoer. He is a kind, godly, caring man with valuable skills that he can add back to the community. Um, and as I'm sure you saw in the materials we submitted, Oliver has undergone extensive programming. He has 14 certificates for behavioral classes, 33 for educational, and 42 for faith-based programs. Um, these programs have helped him improve, show his commitment to his own improvement, and have made him a valuable asset if he is allowed to re-enter the community. Um, and as you heard him speak in his statement, you know, I think the most important thing we saw here today is how deeply Oliver feels remorse for his crime. Um, that is something that will stick with him for the rest of his life and he feels very deeply. Um, and so we request um, under Act 122, Oliver respectfully requests uh, release and parole um, with this, with any conditions the board deems um, appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so could Mr. Meyer, could we hear from the DA's office, please? Good morning, Randy Meyer, assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, I spoke with Mr. Frey over the weekend, the victim, and he continues to have the, the issues as a result of this offense uh, with his fingers. He has no feeling in his fingers. Um, and again, they were almost amputated in this during this robbery. Um, he remains very opposed to parole for uh, Mr. Howard. Unfortunately, he's attended every hearing uh, prior to this one. And unfortunately, he had a work meeting in Florida um, that has caused him to miss the meeting today. Um, in looking at Mr. Uh, Mr. Howard's what he's what he's been doing, particularly since the last hearing in January of 22. And again, the board recommended a long term treatment program for substance abuse. And I don't see that in the record. I, I see he has the living in balance more than two. Uh, he's taken 12 steps that he got in 23. And in November of 22, there's a certificate for a 60 day continual membership in AA. In a. Um, since 2022, that's the only programs that he uh, that I see that he has taken in the record. Um, I don't see any vocational programs at all in the record other than and, uh, I don't consider the Bible college a vocational program, although that's that's very good that he's done that and he should be commended on that. Um, but based on the nature of the offense and the injuries suffered by Mr. Frey and, and the, the strong victim opposition, we remain opposed to his request. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. All right. Is Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Frederick. Uh, I understand about the victim opposition and the law enforcement opposition and all that, but but in looking at this and considering what you've done, um, I I can't hardly do anything in good conscience except to uh, vote to grant you uh, your parole. Uh, I mean, you've been the model. The model rehabilitated prisoner, from what I can tell, 
And uh, so my vote is for granted. Mr. Thomas? Uh, you're planning to go back to work in Hammond and stay with the Sheriff Department. I agree with my uh, colleague to grant you parole. All right, Mr. Howard, uh, you know, uh, I, my vote is the same. You did exactly what the panel asked you to do. You, you went to work and took some AA um, or substance abuse education programs. Uh, you, The warden said good things about you. You have good family support, a low risk store. My vote, as I said, is going to be grant. And if my colleagues have no objection, I would like to add special condition that you do speak to at-risk youth at least four hours a month, community service, four hours a month speaking to at-risk youth. You're to have no contact with Mr. Frey, and we're gonna note in the record the strong opposition from the victim, uh, and that you do, you do go through the parole project's transition plan, which will include a substance abuse evaluation, and you have to comply with any treatment recommendation they may have for you. Do you understand all that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yeah, could you mute us, please? And there you have it. That's the end of Oliver's commutation and parole hearing, unless, of course, he gets revoked. How do you feel about this? You know, it was definitely, I think, a better hearing than the first and the second. But then you might ask, now, is it because he's actually changed? He's actually learned to feel empathy? Or is it because he's learned what to say? He's learned what not to say. Even his supporters weren't as, you know, they had even improved. And it also, of course, makes a big difference that you don't have the victim survivor there making his mic drop emotional statements. Um, but this has been so far a pretty tough board on releases, the sheriff, the preacher, but the sheriff made a statement, you know, <laughs> in so many words, it would be a crime not to let you out with your record and doing everything that we wanted you to do. Um, he has served a long time. We find out his co-defendants served five years. It is, it is uh, you know, if, if I had only seen this hearing and had not seen the prior two hearings, I would say, okay, yeah, you should get out. I mean, he didn't take a life. It was attempted and he served a lot of time. He's done great in prison and yeah, he should get out. But when you have the context of the prior two hearings and you listen, you just listen to them within the past hour and you hear the trauma and you also see the, what appears to be um, a lack of empathy, a lack of understanding, a lack of, you know, just all of the blunders in the prior hearings and the denial. And the, and then it's like, you just have to try to forget about it. That's hard to do. I do wonder how much of it is faked and how much of it is, you know, because if you remember from the first hearing, it was like a complete lack of empathy. The second hearing, his next attempt was, well, I'll pay for the car. I'll pay for his surgery. And it's like, that is so shallow. It's like so hollow. And then on this one, it's, uh, trying to connect it a little bit and more authentically, genuinely. I mean, it makes, a, it makes a huge difference. If the victim comes in there and actually does make a statement, it, it, it does make a big difference, even though his, his statement was through Randy. It also sends a message, I think, when someone says, look, I'm, 
I'm at work. And, you know, you can give whatever reason you want, but being at work is, it, it's still setting a priority, right? And it's still sending a message, whatever that is. I'm not going to interpret it, but um, what do you think? Thank you, Richard, for the information. And if you want to see more parole hearings like this, where we connect the dots, there's a playlist. It's called um, Return of. Check the playlist button. You can see many other hearings where we tie them all together. This one might have been the longest uh, tie together where we have three different hearings. We may have had one or two like this. I can't. Anyways, with that, I'll let you go.